the Lord is the one who opens the doors of opportunity. Uh, like we read last uh, last week in in Second Corinthians, where he says that there is a in an effect of first Corinthians, he says there is an effective door that is open. There are many adversaries and so on. So we know that the Lord works in these ways um, to confirm or for enabling us to partner with him in the work of the gospel, right? The work of mission. So uh, another verse which um, which reminds us of this is in Acts chapter 16. And this is uh, verse 14. It says, now a certain woman named Lydia uh, heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So that is the Lord opened her heart meaning the Lord enabled her, probably the Lord gave her evidence um, and so on. So that is Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. So so we see that uh, there's it's a great reassurance to know that the Lord is, uh, you know, he's not just left us to um, to do this, but he is actually, we are actually co-working with him. He's already, um, he's doing the work right of opening um, um opening hearts or uh, creating an environment for people to actually respond and giving people enough proof and evidence um for the gospel right so it says that the, her heart was opened by the lord um so it, it just means that uh, there was enough evidence given and he worked in her heart or create or gave the gave a proof to understand things um, so that she would come to a place of decision right so so we can uh, we can be greatly um, uh, we can be assured of this that the Lord is working it's not just us our reasoning our ability to confirm things our ability to convince right yes the Lord uses all that uh, but he works sovereignly he works in the hearts of people right okay so let's pray. Father, we thank you that, uh, Lord, you're an awesome God. We thank you that, Lord, that you work in the hearts and minds of people, Lord. In fact, Lord, your, as your word says, that the, the king's heart is in your, your hands, Lord, and you turn it like the rivers of water, God. And so we thank you for uh, all that you do sovereignly in a, in a mighty way, God, among us, Lord. And we pray that even as, uh, Lord, you send us out, Lord, and even as you place us in, Lord, in, uh, Lord, orchestrate appointments and places and people, Father God, that, you, that we, you place us in, God. Lord, we pray that even as we faithfully share, maybe testify, share our witness, Lord, and share what you've done for us, Lord, we, we pray that you would, work on the hearts of people lord as we have seen and, and those near and dear to us and i pray that you would uh, lord uh, speak your word and draw people to the saving knowledge and to also draw them into the plans and purposes that you have for them god we thank you we give you all the praise and glory in jesus matchless name we pray amen amen okay so uh, let's Continue from where we stopped last class. We started with Second Corinthians. I think we um, we actually uh, progressed quite a bit in the first chapter itself, right? And um, I think we stopped at verse four, right, where um, Paul is saying that um, he is actually telling them uh, why he didn't come uh, as earlier planned, why he didn't come on that uh, trip to Macedonia. And uh, right, we all know that Second Corinthians he wrote it from the Macedonian region, um, and uh, like places like Philippi and everything that makes up the Macedonian um, uh, region. So he wrote from from there uh, to the Ephesians. I'm sorry, to the Corinthians. But um, we see that he did not come there as planned. So he explains why, and uh, the fact that he saw some things which were uh, out of place and he also had to intervene in a very uh, strong manner right so he he tells him about that and he says that okay you i know that my visit uh, uh, would have been if I, if I had come there a second time it would have made you even more sorrowful and uh, and he kind of explains that the motive for him to actually address things in a very 
uh, hard manner, uh, which is he says, you know, it was out of love, and he's and he also says that um, the things that he wrote, he wrote uh, from a place of anguish, right? Okay, so uh, let's move on to um, verse five, right? Let me just share the screen. Okay, so verse five. Okay, let's we'll read this chapter two, verse five. But if anyone has caused you grief, has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. And to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Right? So we know that uh, here Paul is referring to that person which he... Uh, which, about whom he wrote, and it was a very uh, strong uh, decision that he uh, wrote about about this particular man, and who was living in sexual sin, sexual immorality, and he had obviously not repented. So, um, if you if you re remember, you know, uh, one Corinthians five and verse five says uh, in the uh, um, Verses four and five, it says, "In the name of the Lord, when you are gathered together, and, you know." Verse five, deliver such a one to Satan for destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, and all that. Like purge out the leaven. Uh, verse seven, it says, "Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened," and so on. Right. So he is talking about that person uh, being put out of fellowship of that church because after repeated. Um, uh, repeated instructions to change, to repent, he has not done so, right? So, so here uh, we see a situation where that person has had a change of heart, right? So he's saying that verse, verse five, verse six, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority you know, is sufficient, right? So he has actually changed, so it is sufficient, so there's no need to continue, right? So he's saying, uh, is put out of fellowship now. This seems to be repentance, so it is sufficient. So, um, lest such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. So that is how we understand. Okay, so he has been sorrowful. He has changed his ways. Um, we infer that he doesn't say directly, but he says, you know, let him, let him, let him not be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Which means that this putting out of fellowship has made him sorrowful, and also uh, maybe change his ways. So that's why he says, you know. Uh, we ought to forgive and comfort him, right? Okay, verse 8, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Right? So he's saying, you know, you reaffirm, reassure that he is loved by all of you. And, uh, you know, he says that I wrote this to you and it was a test you know, for you to take that decision. It was a test of obedience. But I wrote it to you, and uh, therefore you forgive, and whom you forgive, I also forgive. And I have forgiven, he says, I have forgiven that person in the presence of Christ. And and verse 11, he says that, you know, this is, this is the thing. You know, if we continue in unforgiveness, Satan would take advantage of us. He says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, which means that, okay, you know, here the situation has changed. The person has, you know, uh, come to uh, uh, a change in his life. He's brought about a change in his life. He repented. Now we need to forgive. We cannot continue in unforgiveness. We cannot continue in uh, with an offense in our heart. So he's saying, lest Satan should take advantage of us so we are not ignorant of his devices so ignorant of his devices meaning you know ignorant of his ways of his uh, you know evil purpose and so on right so 
So Satan should not take advantage of us, covet us, or you know, gain an entry into our lives. Right? And and this is in line with the, what we see in Ephesians four, where he, he again talks about uh, a period of time, and uh, where if we don't change, we are actually giving a place for the devil. Right? So here it's in the it's in uh, reference to anger. Right? Ephesians four. And if you look at verse 26, he says, Be angry and do not sin. sin. Uh, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So, which means saying, okay, you know, yes, you've been angry, and uh, in your anger, do not sin. Don't react in anger. Don't do things out of that anger. So, in anger, do not sin. Nor uh, and he also says, "Don't let the sun go down on your wrath," which means that if don't don't hold on to that wrath, don't hold on to that anger. Yes, maybe it was a fair thing that uh, maybe it was injustice, maybe it was some unfairness because of which you had that anger. But don't continue with it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And he says, "Nor give a foothold for the devil." It literally means a dwelling place. Don't give the uh, devil a the, uh, foothold. So here, in in uh, the context of forgiveness, again here, saying don't hold on to unforgiveness. There he's talking about don't hold on to wrath. So don't hold on to that unforgiveness because doing so actually gives a foothold for the enemy. Right. So we know his ways. We know that he will just take any uh, space that you give him in order to defraud, in order to take advantage of you. And that uh, take advantage also is in the negative. Way, right, so we are not. Uh, we we know we are not ignorant of his ways. So uh, be careful, right? Okay. Then uh, verse twelve onwards. Uh, let's read. So he says. Furthermore, when I come to Tro when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. To the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Right. So, so he says, uh, you know, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. Again, he's talking about how God gave that opportunity. God created that opportunity, and uh, which I was able to make use of. He gave a uh, door to um, uh, share the gospel to bring the. Uh, good news of the kingdom. Verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit. So, you know, it talks about how he really cares for his team members. And he said, I did not find Titus. So I took leave of them and I went to, uh, you know, moved on to uh, Macedonia. Okay, So so we see that uh, from this verse 14 onwards, where he talks about, you know, that we are the fragrance of Christ in every place and so on. Um, verse 14 onwards, still, the chapter seven, right? So we're talking about uh, a good five chapters. So chapter seven and verse four. Till then, he talks about um, the the ministry that he is doing, right? The apostleship, the ministry, and uh, and uh, and so on. So from from verse five onwards, or that is chapter seven and verse five, he kind of continues on about what happened when they came to Macedonia. So so we see that um, it's like a bracket, it's like a parenthesis where he talks about his ministry and uh, I mean, his ministry, his travel, his uh, you know, apostleship and so on, right? Uh, so, so it's a very personal account that we see uh, from verse 14 onwards, right? Okay, so verse 13, he's talking about Macedonia. And if you look at, if you actually turn to chapter seven, and verse five, he says, you know, he continues on. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, I our bodies had no rest. So it's like, you know, that that whole section 
is like uh, his uh, account, his narrative about um, uh, about the ministry itself, the nature of the ministry, the kind of life that they lived, and so on. Right. So, so let's look at that. So verse 14 and 15, so thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So so it's, uh, you know, Paul being a, a Roman citizen, like we know in Tarsus, and also, have, excuse me, having watched uh, the Roman soldiers and the army carefully, you know, um, see, he uses some of those pictures in, um, in narrating uh, about the the nature of Christ's triumph. In other place also, he uses the picture of the Roman soldier, right? Ephesians chapter six, while talking about the um, the armor of God and the spiritual armor that is available for us. Right? So, so here also he's using a similar picture, and this picture is about the victory parade, the victory march that the Roman army does when they when they actually win a victory over a particular particular nation or some place that they have conquered and and they have this parade or procession um, in the streets of Rome right so so this is what it is so uh, a Barclay a theologian writes like this it says uh, you know in a triumph the procession of the victorious general marched through the streets of Rome to the capital first came the state officials and the Senate then they then came the trumpeters then they were they then they uh, then we carried the spoils taken from the conquered land. Then came the pictures of the conquered land and models of conquered citadels and ships. Right? So it's a very elaborate thing. So they would do this in, you know, like a well-planned procession. Uh, then there was a, also a sacrifice to the deity. So they would sacrifice a white bull um, and then walked the captive princess. So who was taken as prisoners, uh, probably from the rulers of the land, and also those who served in the you know the enemy armies they were also brought whoever was captured was brought in a procession and they would be put in prison or you know executed and so on so then there was also others you know lictors meaning magistrates political uh, people who uh, you know who carried some of these things um, bearing their rods, which means they would symbolically carry certain things which uh, which talked about victory and so on so um, that the name for those people are lictors or magistrates. Right? Um, then followed by musicians. Then also some of the priests who would who would bring the incense as an offering. Okay. So then after that came the general who led the army. Then the finally the army uh, with all their decorations and shouting of triumph and the crowd cheering them and and so on. So it was a you know, it was a big procession. So he's saying that in verse 15, saying, no, thanks be to God who leads us in such a triumphant procession and like puts on display um, the victory to the powers of darkness that, and what is a, what is the victory that you have been brought out of darkness into light? The enemy has been defeated. The enemy has been conquered, right? So, um, so that is the, that is the picture that we have that Christ leading us in a triumphant procession that we being led in a triumphant procession in Christ Jesus, right? And uh, he also talks about the fragrance of his knowledge, right? So, so um, the priest would actually burn those incense, and uh, it that that incense would fill that place, and it would remind them of the triumph, right? The triumph that the Roman army had had in those distant lands. So, um, so here saying this. The knowledge of Christ, uh, the fragrance, like a fragrance, a fragrant incense. Right. So, who is that? Verse sixteen says, uh, verse fifteen it says, "We are, we are to God this fragrance." Right. So we are to God this fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and even among those who are perishing. So it's like the fragrance, the aroma. Of uh, of the knowledge of Christ, right? So that is what he says. He through us he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So we are to God the life that we live, the things that we share. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are saved and among those who are perishing, right? 
um, like the ones who make a choice to accept Christ and the ones who do not. But we are still the aroma of Christ. Verse 16, right? to the one, we are the aroma of death. Right? To the other, the aroma of life leading to life. Right? So even comparing that to the picture, the triumphant procession, this aroma of fragrance that the priests were burning would actually, to the prisoners, it would actually remind them of death. Right? But to all the others, the, the Roman citizens and the army, it's it's a reminder of triumph, a reminder of victory. Right? It's a, it's a triumphant, uh, rejoicing, celebratory thing. But for the others who are the prisoners, it was a reminder that they are going to die. It is actually the aroma of death. Right? So. Similarly, saying to th those who are perishing, well, it is it is not a pleasing thing. Right? To those who reject Christ, to those who are uh, who who willfully uh, do not accept, it is not a pleasant aroma. It is the aroma of death, leading to death. Right? But to the other, it is the aroma of life, leading to life. Right? So they're saying, who's sufficient? Like who's competent? Uh, for these things, who's competent to minister these things. And of course, it is, uh, you know, when we look at chapter 3, he's talking about, uh, we will see that he's talking about how we are sufficient or competent, competent as ministers of the new covenant. Right? So he talks about that. Right? Verse 17, again, he's talking about the ministry and uh, he's saying that we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, and as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Right? So just authenticating the kind of ministry that they did. So, and the kind of ministry that was there at that time also. Right? So we're saying we are not as so many, which means there were more than a few. There were many people uh, who were peddling the word of God. And we see in the, in the book of Acts itself that we read about those Jewish um, itinerant exorcists who, who would go and uh, even though they did not have a relationship with the Lord, they used the name of the Lord and then with disastrous results, right, when it, come, when it came to the exorcism. So he's talking about others who would peddle the word of God. And the word used there, peddle for, uh, peddling the word, uh, in Greek it means to corrupt it. It means to adulterate it. And you know, we can think of someone who is adding water to milk in order to make a profit, right? So to uh, to adulterate something, and is, they do that so that they can it will benefit them. Not the person who is listening, or not the person who is hearing the word of God, but it's definitely benefiting the one who is ministering because it is adulterated. It is watered down. It is compromised, and is it is meant for, uh, you know, just to maybe to just to like uh, you know we read just to tickle the ears, you know, just maybe to entertain the person. Or you know, it is not the full thing. It is not about counting the cost. It is not uh, you know, about the reality of uh, the kingdom of God. It is it is adulterated. It is compromised. Right? So he said, we're not like many who are doing that for the sake of personal gain right for the pay for the sake of monetary gain maybe um, but as of sincerity so our ministry is that which is sin sincere uh, as someone who are sent from god right? but as of sincerity but as from god we speak in the sight of God in Christ, so we're saying he's saying that you know we are accountable. So we speak in the sight of God. So we have come from God, sent by God Himself, and that's how he starts the letter. Right, starts both the epistles. We're saying the sent one, an apostle of Christ. Right? So he's saying who sent it? It's God Himself. It's Christ Himself. So um, we speak as from God. We speak in the sight of God in. Christ. Okay, so, and then he continues again in chapter three, right? So let's uh, continue on to chapter three. Any questions here so far? Anything that you want to add? Anything that you want to share? In chapter two.
right? Okay. So chapter two uh, goes the the some of the high highlights or some things that we see are you know Paul Paul's heart for the people and also his um, uh, his motive for even correction and uh, correction disciplining his motive for that coming from a place of love uh, because out of love he doesn't want to see sin in their lives he doesn't want to want them to be out of out of order out of place in the local church so he's correcting them and also uh, one of the things that we see is the repentance the repentance of the person of the who was actually put out of fellowship he's had a change of heart and and so he Paul's exhortation encouragement to receive him back right forgive comfort receive right so we see that um, like so we understand that even that disciplinary harsh disciplinary thing of putting a person out of fellowship was also from a place of love and and so on so we understand that right okay so let's go on to uh, yeah yes uh, pastor you're able to hear me uh, so the, there is this verse which is talking about uh, uh, the people of God being the fragrance of Christ yeah. among those who are being saved. Yes. And uh, among those, to the other, they are the smell of death. Right. So this is so this would be talking about the recipients themselves, that yes. the ones who receive the gospel, then it's the uh, fragrance of life. Mm. But to those who do not. Yeah. Then they uh, ask. I mean, they are kind of receiving death for themselves, no? Because it cannot be anything to do with the f gospel itself, because that doesn't change. No, no, yeah. Uh, but it is essentially because the people receive do not receive it. Exactly, exactly. Huh? Because yeah. So because if you see, um, you know, even in the uh, in the gospels, we see that in I think it's in John's gospel, we talk about the fact that um, you know he as a son has life, but he does not does not have life so which means that uh, there is that death aspect of death eternity eternal judgment and also it is repulsive to the one who's hearing who does not who rejects Christ this whole gospel message message to them um, it is not something that uh, that they like it is unpleasant for them right? mm -hmm. because maybe they're self-willed maybe they they're self-reliant or you know this whole the thing is is mm. not this too steeped in yeah so so that is why you know it is the aroma of death it's not by itself it's not talking about the message itself but to the recipient like you said the one who's you know receiving or not receiving uh, it's it's perceived in this different ways to one it is pleasant the other one it's it's not repulsive yes thank you yeah. right okay um Right. So let's look at chapter three, right? Chapter three. Okay. So verses one to three. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Right. So, so in in those early days, it was uh, it was um, quite common to send letters of recommendation, and Paul himself, right, he he recommends, like you see him writing about Timothy. Uh, when he comes, you know, to the Corinthians, to, when he comes, receive him, send him on his way. Uh, we see him uh, writing about uh, even Apollos um, in, in the same epistle, you know. And so it was quite common for people to write these letters of uh, uh, commendation or recommendation, um, testifying, just making it authentic, saying, yes, we know the person, and he's so-and-so, and, -so, and you know, if he comes, welcome him, and so on. So this was done. So he asked the Corinthian church, you know, do we need to bring such letters or do we need to give such letters from others to you or do we need letters of commendation from you right? uh, in order to give credibility to, uh, to us as ministers because there were false apostles and, and even false prophets and so on. So he's mentioning that. 
and of course uh, you know later on we will see why he is he is referring you know we, he says uh, um uh, he's comparing the, the ministry with ministry of the false apostles and those who are you know who boast in appearance and and he, he writes about all that right so anyway so uh, here we see he's is asking you know do we need to give it's a rhetoric right and then he goes on to talk about how the they are the proof of the ministry they themselves the life their change and everything th that is their uh, epistle of commendation you know, that is their uh, that is their letter so the life that they are living that is living proof of their ministry and which brings credibility to the ministry so he's saying you are our epistle written in our hearts right? known and read by all men so he's saying okay you are in our hearts and but the lives that you live um, that you lead the lives that we see that transform lives that is you know you are like an epistle you are like a letter and you are known and read by all men okay so you so that, that that is something that he says. So you are our epistle, you know, our, the way we are ministered and what you've received from us, you are known and read by all men. The other aspect is also verse three that you are an epistle of Christ, right? So you are a letter that is written by the Lord Himself, ministered by us. You know, we served, we ministered, and the way we ministered also, he says in verse three, not written not with ink or nat not natural means or um, you know, not just philosophy of man or wisdom of man. So, not uh, written not with ink, right? but by the Spirit of the Living God. So he's referring to this whole writing thing. You know, like you have a writing tablet or some a scroll um, you write on. So it is written not with ink. It is not with natural material, but by the Spirit of the Living God. By the Holy Spirit. So not on tablets of stone, like a scroll or something, or etched on a scroll uh, on a stone, but by tablets of, on the tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. So he's saying that, hey, when we ministered, we ministered, uh, uh, yes, you are an epistle of Christ. Christ is actually testifying and writing about you. But when uh, that whole writing process was actually by, ministered by us, and he's saying it was by the power of the Holy Spirit or the method, Holy Spirit, ordained methods and not by natural means or not, not by man's wisdom right? and we see that you know in in um, the previous episode also uh, he talks about how uh, in in the uh, in chapter 2 right 1 Corinthians chapter 2 he says he reiterates this right about his speech about his ministry uh, it is not with persuasive words of human wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so it was it was not just human wisdom or persuasive words of you know human cleverness or you know articulation and all that but it was with the uh, power of the holy spirit it was a demonstration of the holy spirit manifestation of the holy spirit right so first i'm sorry chapter 12 he lists down the expressions the manifestation of the holy spirit which are the gifts right so so it was in that demonstration when he says demonstration of the spirit it was the power of the spirit it was the gifts of the spirit it was you know the the uh, the end result of the work of the spirit in people's lives transformed lives and speech and action and so on the fruit of the spirit being displayed in their lives all that right so here he's saying that hey, you are an epistle but not written by ink natural means but by the uh, holy spirit and not on tablets of stone but on but on the heart, and so, so this is how it was. You know, you've been ministered by us, but it is actually Christ writing in your hearts, right? and it's an epistle read and known by everyone around, by, by humanity, all people outside. Right? Verse four, and we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant 
right? not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay. So again, he uses that same word which he used earlier, sufficient or sufficiency. So which means the ability, competency of someone. So you know, he's saying we have we trust the Lord, and it's not that we are sufficient, we are competent in ourselves uh, to think that okay, anything is from, from us, you know, all these resources are from us. It is uh, you know, it is because of our own resources, our own abilities. He's saying, but our competency is from God. Again, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, who made us sufficient, who made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. Right. So ministers of the new covenant, we are in a new covenant, new dispensation, and Christ has made us sufficient, competent as ministers, as people who serve in uh, a new covenant, like a servant and who takes care of the, of the assignment of the master, who does the assignment of the master. So He's saying we are servants, that is what the word minister means. And this covenant of the new covenant, it's an agreement, something that is long lasting. Right? We are ministers of that, we are servants of that, not of the letter. So he's saying, okay, just not, not like the law or the not of the letter, but of the Holy Spirit. Right? And he goes on to say, you know, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay. Excuse me. So he's talking about the this covenant, this letter referring to the law or the old covenant, and uh, he brings it out in Romans chapter seven, right, verses five and six. So when he says, "When we were in the flesh, the sinful passions that were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bring fruit to death, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held held by, so that we should serve." In the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Right? Serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Right? Having died to what we were held by, that we should serve. Again, he says, in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. So, so the letter obviously meant the law, the prophets, which was good, which brought us to God, which showed us what was wrong and what was right. And the fact that there was condemnation, which means there was judgment for those who did not keep it. Right? But the Spirit of God becoming a law inside of us, right? beginning a standard a law, the Spirit of God quickening the Word to us, uh, referring or pointing us to the Word, the standards of God. The Holy Spirit not only stopped with that, but He also empowered us. Right? So in that, that this the newness of the Spirit, it brings life. He empowered us to live victoriously daily, every moment, in order to, you know, in order to please God, in order to keep to the the God standards of God, standards of the Lord. Right. So so that is why it says that you know, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now the spirit is obviously not against the letter, right? The word of God, spirit of God, they are one. Don't contradict. Like the, the way the Lord, the uh, Holy Spirit leads, is not contrary to the law, right? And but the spirit empowers one to keep the or adhere to the standards of God. Right, so, so it says that um, yeah, the the things in the flesh uh, actually were aroused to to know the difference and um, and also to to um, you know to not keep the law. Right, so we were we were incompetent or we were helpless. So it says we were in the flesh, but then now that we were we have died to what we were held by. Right, Romans six talks about that. Right, and that is why. Here in seven, he's referring to uh, the fact that we had died to what we were held by. So Romans six, he says, you know, the body of sin is death, but we have died. And when when Christ uh, died on the cross, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. And in baptism, that is a uh, representation of that buried. And when he coming out of the water, you know, we we are raised again to newness of life. So that whole 
thing he mentions in 6 and then in Romans 7, saying, we were in the flesh and uh, we, the, the law was wor at work in our members to bring fruit to death, but now we have been delivered because we have died to what we were held by, we were died to the law, and we have been released to the newness of life and that we should serve the uh, in the newness of the spirit. So, so that is the... Uh, that is the change that we are ministers of the new covenant, right? So he says, "Who uh, we are ministers of the new covenant, uh, not of the letter, but of the spirit." Okay. Then, verses uh, following this, verse seven onwards, he talks about this uh, this distinction about the old covenant, about the new covenant, right? About the the ministry of whatever happened in the old covenant and the ministry of the new covenant and uh, it talks about the distinction of that or um, you know the the stark difference between both right so let's let's read it and then we'll take a break right so uh, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the face of moses because of the glory of his countenance which glory was passing away how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until um, this day, um, sorry, the minds were blinded. For until this day, uh, um, the veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, um, so we'll take a break, ten minutes, and when we come back, we'll um, just go into the details of this. Right? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 